Welcome. Today I'm going to talk to you about glide path management. Out of all the things that I speak about in the course of a year, I would say that the most important topic that you see on this menu is glide path management. You can't begin to even have discussions about canal preparation, three-dimensional disinfection, and filling root canal systems if in fact we don't have glide path management. So glide path management is a very interesting field and from my experiences as a teacher I can tell you it's usually where we have problems. If you look at ledges, blocks, broken instruments, all these things occur because we don't have a smooth reproducible glide path. Let's get started. When we break glide path management out into its subsections, you can see it's quite complicated. In this specific section, I will talk about glide path management and preparation sequence. In subsequent sections, I will speak about how to prepare canals and secure glide paths using mechanical instruments such as the path files. Then we'll talk about what we do in the instance where there is an irregular glide path. Well, whether we're working in dilacerations, whether we're sliding instruments over a few millimeters, all this does is tell us that we need to be very cognizant of root canal system anatomy. When we look at this spinning tooth, it's a little bit sobering to see how complicated the internal anatomy really is. If you look at the apical one-third of the mesial root, this is very commonly what we encounter on an everyday basis clinically. If we come in a little bit tighter, we can see a more formidable job as we begin to visualize more carefully the dilacerations, the deep bifidities, the anastomosing between systems, lateral canals. All these things are what we have to be aware of when we're sliding small-sized hand files through curvature to length. The goal of any practitioner doing endodontics is to get a small-sized hand file to length, not once, not twice, but on a reproducible basis. And once we can catheterize the canal and have a loose, small size hand file at length, everything begins to fall into place and all subsequent steps become much easier to fulfill. Let's look at an extracted tooth and you can see dilacerated roots, very, very complicated. And when you look right at them head on, you can see that they have apical bifidity, both MB and DB. Notice how curved these roots are and they're multi-planar curvatures and we would imagine that the canals are more curved than the roots that actually hold them. If we look at this maxillary first molar from the bottom up, you're looking right into that trifurcation. Notice the MB root. Large concavity on the fercoside Look how broad that root is, mesial to distal. And when we're doing glide path management, you can begin to appreciate that there's going to be MB2s and MB1s in these roots over 90% of the time. And that's because broad roots hold two systems frequently. Notice the bifidity on the Paolo knee cross section based on the level that you would choose to look at it. Let's come in tighter. If you look at that MB root, you begin to start to notice that there are foramina associated with the apical one-third. Let's come in tighter as we rotate the tooth. There's one, there's the second one, there's the third one, and we can rotate around and see the fourth one, and then up on top, there's the fifth one. So there's an example of a root with multiple apical portals of exit. We see these cases clinically. This is a beautiful case done by my friend, John West. Dr. John practices up in Tacoma, Washington, and these are pro-taper shapes, but the point of showing you these cases is they had to have been glide path first. You cannot use mechanical instruments when canals aren't secured. Notice the MB, multi-planar curvature. Notice off the MB in the apical one-third, there's some puffs on the external root surface. And if you count carefully, you'll see five puffs associated with that MB filled system. Notice the DB. In this distal view, radiographically, that distal system makes a 90 degree turn and that's after shaping. How do you shape around curvature? 
if you have a glide path, that's the answer. Well, John West has a son named Jason. Jason's a phenomenal clinician, and you can notice in this mandibular second molar, again, how do you shape such exquisitely these kinds of difficult systems? Well, the answer again is you have to have a glide path. All the shapes you're looking at were made by ProTaper. Bula, a good friend of mine in South Africa, you can see he's playing the curves. He can glide path around these significant curvatures and once he has the canals secured and he has a smooth reproducible glide path, he can shape these canals. In this case, he used the ProTaper system. Dominique is a gifted clinician based in Europe and you can see that this mesial system is very, very complicated. Dominique said to me when he shared this case with me, Cleave, Cleave, this was 31 millimeters of pleasure. Well, if you look at that mesial buckle and mesial lingo, I don't know how much pleasure it was doing that, but it was sure managed exquisitely. Notice the multiplanar curvature. Again, how do you shape these with Pro Taper? You have to have a glide path is the secret. Tom McClammy, marvelously trained dentist, trained with Schilder. I guess it's obvious when you look at the film, we could probably sit here and talk about glide path management for more than an hour. But notice how complicated the internal anatomy is in this mandibular molar. Notice how there's a little loop off the apical one-third of the mesial system. Glide path leads to shaping, shaping leads to disinfection, and canals that are cleaned out can actually be filled in three dimensions. But we have to assume and start with the concept we got to have a glide path. Historically, glide path was taught in the following way. Clinicians were told to use small size, most flexible hand files, and typically we would start with a 10 file, and we would work the 10 file through the length of the canal to the desired working length. My point is, most of us were taught to carry small size hand files at our earliest convenience to the full length. If the 10 wouldn't go, we might drop down and use the 08. And in instances where an 08 wouldn't go to length, we might even have to employ an 06. But in any event, we always wanted to get back to the 10, whether we used the 6 or the 8, because once we got to the 10, that would transition us to the 15, and pretty much if we had a 15 to length, we could then talk about using mechanical methods to shape canals. So to leave this slide, I'll summarize by saying most of us were trained to use small sized hand files and negotiate and secure the full length of the canal pretty much immediately. This caused a lot of problems. Going to length immediately and trying to catheterize canals, I could give an all day lecture on it, but what I would say is if you go to my website, you can find several articles that you can download for free, they're PDFs, and you can talk about, or read about, I should say, what I talk about. And what I talk about are the advantages of not doing this. And I'm going to talk about a different way for glide path management. Many of you are trained to pre-curve your files. How do you pre-curve a file and slide that instrument through canyons of restrictive dentin and expect the instrument to arrive in the curvature curved? The next question you should ask is how much reagent is actually in the root when you're trying to go to length first. You might see a pulp chamber full of a viscous chelator, but there's very little reagent that's getting lubricated onto the file and being carried into the canal, which means the canal's working initially in a dry environment. This is, encourages the debris to move into the anatomy and block. This encourages and promotes block canals. Many dentists would think of a block canal as the inability to pass a tin file through the length of the canal to the terminus. My assertion is there is that kind of a block, but there's also another kind of a block. And canals are frequently blocked laterally, and they're blocked with dental mud. And dental mud, when it blocks the orifice to a lateral canal, means it prevents the exchange of sodium hypochlorite into this deep lateral anatomy. So there are block canals, and not only is the main system blocked, but oftentimes the lateral canals are blocked as well. When we go to length, 
immediately we push more debris through the foramen. This causes post-operative problems. And there are many, many other instances and situations that arise trying to go to length immediately. So let's talk about a different way to do glide path management. First of all, let's look at the anatomy of a human tooth. Most teeth are about 19 to 25 millimeters in their overall length. Most teeth have about 10 millimeters of clinical crown. If we subtract 10 from 19 and 10 from 25, the difference is 9 to 15 millimeters. If we divide our roots into coronal, middle, and apical one-thirds, then each third is about 3, 4, or 5 millimeters in its overall length. What I want you to think about is access. There's coronal access and there's radicular access. And if we have done our coronal and radicular access, we will have pretty much not only great access through the clinical crown, but we'll have the restrictive dentin removed out of the coronal three, four, and five millimeters. This means that we only have a little job left of six to 10 millimeters to do with mechanical instruments or instruments used manually. The preparation sequence that we're going to talk about today is a sequential preparation where we do the upper two-thirds first and once the upper two-thirds has been pre-enlarged then we'll work in the apical one-third. Let me say it in a more precise way. In this method of sequencing the glide path we're going to use 10 and 15 hand files to scout the coronal two-thirds of the root. Once we have a reproducible glide path in the coronal two-thirds with small size hand files, we can shape that region with mechanical instruments. Typically one or two instruments can be used to provide an optimal shape. Once the coronal two-thirds has been optimally pre-enlarged, only then will we use small size hand files to scout the rest of the canal. It would be at this time when we scout the apical one-third that we would want to know the vertical extent of treatment. This is where we would get working length. This is when we would confirm the canal is still patent. And this is when we determine whether we have a reproducible glide path in the apical one-third. If we do have a reproducible glide path in the apical one-third, then this region can be mechanically shaped, blending the deep shape up into the body of the canal. If we determine that we do not have a reproducible glide path in the apical one-third, well, then we would prepare the apical one-third manually using shaping files. Let's take a closer look. When we scout canals, it is my feeling as an educator that we should use a viscous chelator. A viscous chelator does three important things. One, it's a superior lubricant. Two, it's an emulsifier. And three, the debris that's being generated by the hand file is more effectively held in suspension. Viscous chelators are examples, RC Prep, ProLube, or Glide. So we're going to use a tin hand file in the presence of a viscous chelator to secure canals. Let me review that again. Viscous chelators are profoundly more appropriate than an aqueous bath of a reagent, any reagent. The viscous chelator gives us a superior lubricant, which means we can slide through canals much more effectively. We can move around sheaths of fibrotic tissue and we can bypass little denticles or stone. These stones can be attached or loose within the body of the canal. So we want to get a superior lubricant inside the canal to offer forgiveness. Emulsifying is kind of a word that is misunderstood sometimes but we begin to break down collagenous tissue, especially in the vital case when we gain access and we see bleeding, we know there's collagen present. Collagenous tissue is kind of like a glue-like mass and when you pull an instrument out of collagenous tissue, the tissue tends to readhere to itself. So to prevent the readherence of tissue, an emulsifier like ProLube, Glide, or RC Prep can leave a favorable pilot hole in that tissue for the next sequential hand file. And finally, the hand files are generating debris, they're breaking up pulp tissue, and all this is being moved into suspension. A viscous chelator more effectively holds this debris in suspension 
whereas in an aqueous bath, the debris tends to fall in an apical direction, which again promotes or invites a blocked canal. Okay, now that we have identified the viscous chelators, now that we know a little bit about what the advantages of a viscous chelator are, let's talk a little bit about how to exactly use the tin file. I would like you to reciprocate the handle in very small angles back and forth between your, the pad of your index finger and your thumb. So you got your gloves on and you're grabbing the handle of the file and it's a little back and forth wiggle and that begins to pull the file down into the canal. When the handle is just snug, not tight, just snug, pull. When you pull, you're cutting on the outstroke. You're cutting away from the terminus. And importantly, you're cutting towards the bigger diameters. This is the antithesis of how most of us were taught to work small-sized hand files. Most of us were taught through decades of education to cut into the canal. This method is cutting out of the canal. So let's go through it again. Wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. That pulls the file down in. We call that feed it in. So feed the file in two, three, four millimeters. When the handle's just snug, pull. And importantly, we're cutting away from the terminus and to the bigger diameters and on the outstroke. That's one cutting cycle. So feed it in pull is a single cutting cycle. Now feed it in a little bit deeper. When the handle is just snug, pull. That's the second cutting cycle. Again, each feed it in pull is a single cutting cycle. By feeding the instrument in and pulling, we're expanding, smoothing, and refining the glide path. I'll use six cutting cycles with the 10 file followed by six cutting cycles with the 15 file through any region of the canal to create a glide path. I'll also say in slang, a slide path. So we want a really smooth slide so we can just move in, bounce around in there gently, smoothly, and progress apically. We're not trying to go to length. We're only going in about two-thirds of the overall distance. You can see the rubber stop is short. The rubber stop is never allowed to move down to the full expected working length. We have put the overall expected tentative working length on the instrument. So the file is set at the expected diagnostic working length. However, if it's a one millimeter stop, we're going to keep the stop back about three stops, which would imply we're short. And we're going to create a slide path short of length. You can see by working about three stops short, we're working more in the straightaway portions of the canal. Let's look at how this would look in animation. With the pulp chamber full of a viscous chelator, wiggle, 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 pull. Feed the instrument in a little bit deeper when the handle's snug, pull. Feed it in a little bit deeper, pull. Now work the file in and out in little short one millimeter amplitude strokes. This is carrying more viscous chelator in, on the blades, on the file, and hauling that viscous chelator into the field of action. By cutting in a little bit deeper and pulling, and after two or three more cycles, we've now done our six cycles, and now we're checking to see if we have a reproducible slide path over a range of a few millimeters in the coronal two-thirds of the root. If we can slip and slide, and slide and glide over the upper two-thirds, push the stop down, pull the instrument out, and we can now transfer that length to our first mechanical file. Well, it's time to irrigate. So we would irrigate with sodium hypochlorite. When we irrigate with sodium hypochlorite, and it's combined with a viscous chelator, the combination is the release of oxygen. And you'll see a lot of effervescence. And all these bubbles send to produce the elevator action, which moves debris up and out of the canal towards the occlusal table, 
where it can be suctioned safely off the occlusal table by the dental assistant. We now have a slide path that's very producible in the upper two-thirds, and so we can shape this region, and we can shape it with rotary files. In this case, we'll shape it with ProTaper. You can see in this image we've adjusted the rubber stop as I previously shown on the 15 file. Now we need to adjust the rubber stop on Shaper 1. This is the ProTaper shaping file and we want to make sure the shaping file stays inside the safe zone that was previously confirmed to be secured with the 15 file. Once that rubber stop's been adjusted, then we can immediately begin to think about shaping this region of the canal. In a bath of sodium hypochlorite, we can float into the canal and before resistance start brushing laterally. The secret of the ProTaper shapers is by brushing laterally, we make lateral space, which allows the Eiffel Tower blades of the shaper to progressively move deeper into the canal. Remember, ProTaper is the only instruments on the market today that have increasing percentage taper over the length of a single blade. After every rotary file, irrigate, recapitulate with a 10 file, and then re-irrigate. Here we are with Shaper 2. The stop's been adjusted so that this instrument stays inside the secured zone that was confirmed with the 15 hand file. Again, in one or more passes, the instrument's allowed to float in passively, and by laterally brushing, we can expand the shape, which allows the instrument to easily move deeper into the canal. Pull out the instrument and note the debris. The debris should always be away from the terminal part of the file. After every rotary file, irrigate to flush out gross debris, recapitulate with a tin file to break up debris and move it into solution, and then re-irrigate to liberate that debris. Always after every rotary file, regardless of manufacture, irrigate, recapitulate, and re-irrigate. Well now we need to scout the apical one-third. Take your irrigating syringe and aspirate all the solution out of the pulp chamber and the canals that you're treating. By aspirating out all the sodium hypochlorite, you're making space so we can now flush in there some viscous chelator. Again, you can use RC Prep Pro Luber Glide. Again, we've never been in the apical third, so we need forgiveness, and the viscous chelator will give us a superior lubricant, it will give us an emulsifier, and it'll give us the ability to hold debris more effectively in suspension so we don't encourage a block canal. Now, there's many, many things that I want to talk about when we talk about scouting the apical one-third. But first of all, you're going to have the rubber stop set on the 10 file to the full expected diagnostic working length. By setting the stop at the full expected tentative working length, we now need to know the vertical extent of treatment. So we've made a more direct path to the terminus because we've done pre-enlargement. Notice how loose the instrument is over a significant number of its blades. Now when the clinician feels a little bit of pressure between the pads of their index finger and their thumb, it's translating to the instrument engaging dentin towards its terminal extent. Notice how you now have newfound skills, control, and dexterity. Again, with the viscous chelator, as we begin to work that instrument through the apical one-third, when we get about one millimeter away from the full length, we want to slide to length. Do not keep reciprocating the handle. We do not want to transport or tear the foramen or push a lot of debris needlessly through the constriction. So let's just slide in and out. It's more of a linear motion. So you're going to use your apex locator or take a working film to nail down the vertical length of treatment, working length. You want to confirm patency because the canal was patent before we ever entered the canal. So if the canal is been treated properly, it should still be patent and we should insert a tin file gently and minutely through the foramen to clear debris from this region. And the third thing we do in the apical one-third after working length and patency, we want to know do we have a confirmed reproducible glide path so we can use mechanical instrumentation in this region of the canal. So let's look and see how this would occur. 
Before we talk about making a glide path to the full working length, what is the working length? This has caused an enormous amount of confusion, the vertical extent of our endodontic treatment. And the confusion occurs because how we were all educated and what we've been taught in the various schools that were attended. But we were taught ideally that the vertical extent of treatment would terminate at the cementinal dentinal junction, where the cementum meets the dentin. This point has been referred to as the minor constriction, the minor foramen, or what I'm calling the physiologic terminus. The reason I think this is an inappropriate level to work to is because by working short, we know that debris is going to accumulate. And as we work through a little bit of time, through a series of instruments that have bigger tip diameters and apical tapers, we're going to be generating a lot of mud. And the fatal flaw in clinical endodontics is the production of dentine mud. And this mud begins to accumulate, and oftentimes the colleague is working conscientiously a little short, but by the time they fit their cone, they end up even considerably shorter than was their intention. So I'm going to talk to you about working to the radiographic terminus. The radiographic terminus is the only landmark that is reproducible from country to country, from state to state, from city to city, from office to office, and from practitioner to practitioner. I want you to know that Ruddle knows that when we work to the RT, the instrument is minutely long. But importantly, we're going to be able to not be blocked, and we're going to have our irrigant work off the body of the canal out into the dentinal tubules and into lateral canals when present. The other landmark that is commonly talked about but really is irrelevant in this discussion is the radiographic apex. Colleagues oftentimes talk about working to the apex. Well, we all know that canals terminate oftentimes at positions other than the radiographic apex. So it's more accurate to talk about carrying instruments to the terminus as you can observe them with a radiograph. Let's look at these concepts then in our animation. We can use our fingers and just pre-curve a file terminally, or you can roll a cotton plier, slide it down the instrument and pre-curve it. But a pre-curved file can move easily through a pre-enlarged canal. And the point is, when we arrive in the curvature, the instrument is optimally pre-curved. With a viscous lead chelator, we can begin to just make little micro back and forth rocking motions to pull the file in. As the instrument moves inward, we create a little bit of space, and by working it in up and down short amplitude strokes, what we can do is smooth and refine and expand. Now we can reciprocate the handle of a small size hand file a little bit more to pull it in. But that last one or two millimeters, when we move from the PT to the RT, it's a linear slide. We don't want to be reciprocating the handle of a 10 file when the rubber stop is close to the selected reference point because, again, this would invite needlessly moving debris through the foramen or ripping the foramen and causing post-operative problems. So just try to slide to the radiographic terminus. This is when you could use your apex locator. If you use an apex locator, it's going to be optimal conditions because you have a viscous chelator already inside the canal. This is a much better medium than a sodium hypochlorite bath. And by pre-enlarging, we're more confident that the terminal part of the file is engaging dentin. And by engaging dentin, we're grounding the electronics so we get a more stable readout as we look at our digital display. So pre-enlargement procedures make apex locators more reliable. Finally, if you're using a film and using film-based photography, oftentimes in a pre-enlarged canal, the instrument that's snug at length, it could be a 10 or it could be a 15. If we can get a 15 down here, that's great because that means if we're looking at a radiograph, we're going to have something that's more opaque because it's going to be read as more radiographically opaque because of its bigger chunk of metal. So by having a 10 or a 15 file at length, we're going to be able to be more confident with our apex locators if we're using that method to determine working length or if we're using a film we can usually slide in a little bigger file than, as an example, a 6 or an 8, and that means metallurgically 
or have more radio opacity because a radio opaque file at 15 is much bigger and whiter visually radiographically than the 10. Well, you have a known working length. Now I want you to establish patency. I want you to move the instrument deliberately and repeatedly through the foramen, gently to the other side. And by doing this repeatedly, the instrument's beginning to become loose. I want to talk about a loose tin versus a tight tin. A loose tin can move easily and you could push it theoretically with your nose to length. Now we need to check if we have a glide path. If we can pull the instrument back without reciprocating the handle one or two millimeters and slide back in, now pull the file back three or four millimeters and see if you can slip and slide back to length, and now pull it back progressively further. And if this instrument can travel over the apical three, four, or five millimeters by slipping and sliding, sliding and gliding, anytime you want to because you say so, not only do you have a glide path, but you own the glide path. And you can look up this reference and talk about the importance of glide path in the mechanical preparation of canals. If we have a glide path in the apical one-third, it will not be too difficult to shape this region. And it's just a little job. We only have to shape the apical three, four, five millimeters because the upper two-thirds has already been pre-enlarged. Like before, we'll flush with sodium hypochlorite to flush out all the viscous chelator. Again, we'll see a lot of effervescence and we'll see a lot of debris and bubbles emanating towards the occlusal table. With a bath full of sodium hypochlorite, we can now begin to shape the apical one-third. And if we had a glide path, we can use rotary files or reciprocating files. And if we don't have a glide path, we'll have to finish this three to five millimeters manually. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. Well, I'm using ProTaper. It's the number one file sold internationally in the world today. It easily outsells all the systems by multiples. So we would use the ProTaper purple followed by the white. And again, purple and white aren't doing a lot of work towards their terminal extent, but they're shaping in a crown down way. Then we use the first finisher, F1. Notice the debris on the apical extent of the flute but oftentimes the shape needs to be a 2508. So here comes a Pro Taper F2, and that's a 25 tip diameter with an 8% taper only in the apical one-third. By shaping the apical one-third and blending the deep shape up into the body of the canal, we now have a fully uniformly tapered canal from the orifice to the terminus. I'm not really talking about shaping, we're talking about glide path, but in doing a sequential glide path, we have to shape to remove restrictive dentin coronally so we can glide path the apical third. And now I've just demonstrated how we can use rotary files to prepare that three, four, or five millimeters. I've always said, and I will continue to say, that whoever owns the glide path wins the mechanical game of endodontics. From my 35 years of practicing, I can tell you that over 91% of my practice is redoing other people's endodontics. It's called retreatment. And that means out of every 1,000 patients I see, 900 have already had endodontics. And I can look back at pretty much all the failures I've seen over the years, and the failures result, regardless of the etiology, they typically result because of failure to have a glide path.